we've been talking about teachers a lot, and actually the next uh, panel will be looking at the UK more specifically, but also we'll actually have a, a teacher here. So let me welcome uh, the panelists for our second panel. Emma Williams, CEO, Student Action for Refugees. Andrea Zafiraku, teacher and 2018 Global Teacher Prize winner. And uh, Kiri Tungs, president of the NUT, if you could please join me here. Uh, on the podium. Before we were looking at the global uh, issue and now we're going to localize it uh, to the UK, look at the issues and challenges here, especially trying to foster diversity in our classrooms, uh, uh, both higher and uh, you know primary and secondary education. Um, just going to start with, we've been talking a lot about teachers, we actually have one on the panel now, so that's great. Um, but let's start with Emma Williams, who's CEO of Student Action uh, for Refugees. Now across UK universities, uh, students Students and staff have actually been trying to come up with ideas to make the whole university experience uh, and the place of education more accessible uh, and welcoming to asylum seekers. And I think there's actually a project that you started. Tell us a little bit more about what you are doing uh, to make these places, I guess, more welcoming, really. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, the NGI I work for, Student Action for Refugees, is uh, a, a network of uh, student union societies, and we have. Uh, societies at 50 universities across the UK and, and a couple of colleges as well. So we have 34,000 members who are all students themselves and you know, we exist to support those students to welcome refugees and advocate for refugee rights in the UK. We're very interested in refugee rights in the UK. Um, and, and I should say, you know, when I, when I talk about refugees, unless I'm specifying, I mean anybody who is in any part of the asylum process because what's so crucial in the UK is where you sit in the asylum process because your rights are very different. Um, so we, we, we do a number of uh, projects. Uh, the, the three things that we get the students to do, one is to volunteer in the local community. We have 4,000 refugees at any time volunteering in, in the community. Um, the second is to educate fellow students about asylum, and that's to build a, a, a welcome, a culture of welcome across the, the, the country, really, as those students graduate and, and go into uh, uh, places of influence. But finally, we, we campaign and advocate um, and, and I think the piece that is, is probably most relevant here is uh, we've been running a, a campaign, for want of a better word, for the last 10 years called Equal Access, which is around improving access to higher education for refugees and asylum seekers. And we are, we've been specifically looking at the um, financial barriers. So um, if, effectively, if you're still in the asylum process, if you're an asylum seeker, you're classed as an international student for fee purposes. You're also prevented from working. So unless you are one of, the, one of the, the asylum seekers that comes with their own funds, and there are some, or has access to funds, you cannot work. Uh, you, you must live on state support, which is just over five pounds a day, yet your class is an international student, and you can't access student finance. It's impossible. It's completely impossible. Um, you know, the, the reasons behind that are, are principally around a, a system that doesn't want to encourage people to come here um, and claim asylum. There is a, there is a language of pull factors, and um, you know, whereas we, we we all know it's actually push factors. Um, so our um, strategy has been on two levels. The, the principal one has to get the, get the students themselves to join STAR and then advocate inside their own universities to create scholarships. So um, from no scholarships in 2008, we now have 64 institutions, uh, universities across the UK that have special scholarships for refugees and asylum seekers, which, which is huge. You know. um, we estimated the, the value is eight and a half million uh, a year. Um, obviously, it's a drop in the ocean of the number of scholarships that are required, but it is an absolute start. And I think for us, what we've witnessed has been the outgrowing of interest and support from uh, universities to create those scholarships. And the way we do it is we, we basically, you know, the students will join STAR, they'll, often they'll want to volunteer, they'll have been volunteering in, often these days, in, in Calais or Greece, um, and then they will become very interested and wanting to make a, a difference for refugees on the ground, and we say to them, look, you are, for want of a better word, purchases inside your institutions now, and you have power here, you know, it's all very nice to go out and campaign for all sorts of things, but you have power inside your institution, and your VC has to listen to you. So it has been hugely successful. We've seen a, a, a massive, massive increase since 2015 in the picture of little Alan Curdy. So 2015, we had 14 institutions on board. So in the last three years, we brought all the others on board, 50 more on board. And I think that is a testament to, to the uh, 
I mean, I, I see a massive support in, in the higher education sector for including refugees. Um, the, the question mark now is how we do that effectively. Um, and then sort of finally, the, the last piece that we've been doing, that the strategy was to first go to the universities, because we know that the, we knew the government would not change. Um, uh, so to go to the universities first and then get the, particularly the senior staff within the universities, particularly the chancellors, uh, who will, many of whom sit in the Lords and can affect public policy. Um, so we've had three successful campaigning pieces where we've managed to achieve national policy change as a result of pressure brought on. I mean, obviously we've been placing it, we've been lobbying, but it's particularly one which was very definitely pressure from chancellors in the Lords where um, if you are resettled in the UK, so the 20,000 Syrians uh, that are being brought currently, you're, or the, the, the Afghan interpreters who are being brought currently, um, you are given humanitarian protection rather than refugee status. What that means is for reasons that I still don't understand, um, you are classed as a home student for fee purposes, so lower, but you, have to, but you are classed as a returning British national and you have to wait three years before you can access student finance. You're also only given five years leave to remain. So the whole thing is completely mad. Um, but also, we live in this strange time where everyone thinks that the Syrians are some kind of better class of refugee, unfortunately. So um, we were able to advocate quite strongly with the government that, you know, you are bringing people over. It is your policy and you're not educating them. So we took an amendment to the HE bill um, a couple of years ago and, you know, the government didn't want, didn't want to have any amendments. Um, and, and we got a party to back it, but it was the point in the Lords where Alf Dubbs was about to get up and speak that Amber Rudd's assistant came scuttling across the floor and said, um, and, and what happened was far more than we hoped for, actually. They were, we asked for them all to be given immediate access to student finance. They were all given full refugee status. So it, it is, to me, it's the kind of, it's the positive piece of, a, of, of quite a dark story at the moment in Europe, which I was saying, to, to, to finish, I would say I wouldn't call this a refugee crisis in Europe. I would call this a failure of politics. A million people arriving is not a big deal for us, and we've dealt with it before. I think a lot of people would agree with you on that final point. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it is nice to start on a, on a high <laughs> point, so, so that's good. Um, uh, Andrea Zafiraku, we've been talking about teachers a lot in the previous yes. panel as well. Of course, you are a teacher, but also technically speaking, you're the best teacher in the world because, <laughs> congratulations, you are the winner of the 2018 Global, Global Teacher Prize. So really, well done. It was, you know, Great Thank to see you. you winning. I think it was Dubai, wasn't it? That was the, it. Yeah, so well done. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you were watching the panel before, we were all talking about the importance of diversity. I mean, obviously, you know, in parts outside of the UK, slightly different issues, but here in the UK as well, um, the importance of a diverse student body and diverse teachers to, to deal with some of the issues or potential problems that might uh, arise. So tell us a little bit about what your classroom is like, because you know, you have hands-on experience every day um, of the classroom. Tell us a little bit about the students, the languages, the backgrounds, and how a diverse teacher body helps all of it gel. I'll talk about my school actually, because I don't think it's just my classroom, it's my school. So um, my school is approximately 30 minutes from here, it's in Brent. Brent is one of the most diverse um, planets on this earth. <laughs> um, we have got approximately 150 languages spoken in our borough. Um, our, our school is rich in terms of the diversity and the cultures that are there. It's, it's a beautiful place. And I think that's a testimony to the families that bring, our ch bring their children to our school. Um, they do come from travelled backgrounds. Many of them are migrants, many of them are refugees. But when, you, when they come to the school, they don't stand out because they're not alone. Um, we have many, many students who have got very similar stories as well. Um, and the one thing that we do do is that uh, I feel that we are extremely inclusive. And the way that we do that is that the moment a child comes into the school, regardless of their backgrounds, they have got, we interview them, we interview them in their own language if that's what's necessary. Um, and we ensure that we put a bespoke curriculum for them. Now, I did listen to the panel before, and I think it was quite interesting talking about um, one of the gentlemen said about the national curriculum, how um, it may not be relevant. Well, actually, I think that's a really good point, because if, as a teacher, I find the pressures are that if I'm trying to deliver a, a curriculum and I'm being held to account for that, um, am I really ensuring that I'm providing the best education for that child in front of me? And the answer is no. 
So what we try and do is we have a much more bespoke um, package or programme for the students. We ensure that when they come to the school, we, um, we, we ensure that we have a curriculum for them that they can follow. But when we say that, we, um, we've got to be very careful and mindful because, as you said, that you know, with many of our students who come from Syria, they come from very... Um, they, they have got experience going to school and um, they have got incredible skills and knowledge and the only thing that's making them have a barrier to accessing all of the subjects is language. We are aware of that. So we make sure that we put them in um, and we filter um, and cre create them with opportunities to excel in other subjects such as the arts, which I'm a huge advocate of. Because <laughs> um, um, I think with the arts and subjects like physical education, uh, music, drama, they, they just gain so much confidence. And because of these subjects, they are much more easily um, able to feel part of the school community and also to, um, you know, to feel that they can achieve and feel confident. Um, mechanisms that we use, we will take whatever we can. <laughs> we will go to the local mosque to ask for support their volunteers to come and help us with translation if we need that. We'll go to the local temple. Just outside my school we have got two churches and we've got um, a temple and a mosque. That's how diverse the, our high street is. <laughs> um, it's lovely. Um, and um, you know, we, we try and make sure that we bring in the parents, so we bring in the families into our school. We celebrate the cultures. We ensure that we teach them about their cultures. And uh, being an art teacher, that's the most easiest thing that we can do. So if we have got families who are coming from um, Syria, um, you know, we introduce them to their art and say, you know, this is you know this is what happens. And does this look right? No, their face just glows up. Oh my God, I'm interested. They're interested about me, they're interested about my culture and heritage. They then come in the next day and they try and bring something from their homes so that they can feel um, connected with where they are now. And I think that's that is, I think, the key to ensuring that a child has got a positive start to the school. So if you go into our playground, it's um, quite unique. So you will find at break time and at playtime you have um, a cricket match over there. So you've got India and versus Pakistan playing cricket over there. Um, and over here you've got Africa and Ghana playing football. Um, but at the end of the day, they, they enjoy the integration. They, there is a family feeling there. And what we're very mindful of is that, you know, we know that children aren't born with prejudice. It's, it's the adults and what's their, what they're exposed to. So we make sure that we monitor that very, very carefully. And hopefully through that, they, and actually not hopefully, I know, that they will then go back into their own societies and, and, and do incredible work. And just remind us of what the age group is. 11 to 18, so we have the years 11 to 18, secondary school education. And, and just focusing on the point that you raised, obviously, of language, mm. uh, which can be a barrier. And, uh, and I say this as someone who had to learn English at school at the age of nine when I moved to a different country, and I still remember how alienating it was. How do you deal with that? I mean, apart from putting the kids in other classes as well and asking uh, for help, as you were mentioning, for translation. Is there any scope for special one-to-one -one tuition at any point? Do you ever feel that actually some kids are being left behind because they're finding it too difficult to deal in their second language? I think well, I also um, was raised with Greek as being my first language, so I completely understand the situation and where our students are exposed to. Um, the question is, how are we helping the teachers? How, what, what are we doing for them to give them the tools and to give them the opportunities? So we do have as many... Um, schools have and are fortunate to have, we have got staff who are there to support the students in terms of providing um, uh, bilingual skills. Um, and we have a very much, you know, we differentiate, we make sure that there's um, resources and we tap into everything to ensure that we can ensure that the students make progress. And my God, they do make exceptional progress. They, mo they make more progress than many of our students who are born in this country, which is quite incredible. Um, and. Again, going back to the teachers, which you know, which we were talking about earlier, um, it really is thinking about how they are trained, because I, I think that um, there's an assumption now that teacher training means that you can go into a classroom and then you'll be able to, you know, be that super that super um, hero person on that on that cartoon. Um, but I think there needs to be much more more invested in teacher training and ongoing support, because our children are coming into our schools with complex, complex um, problems and you know some of the things which some of the <coughs> stories which our children are are writing about just quite freely in their English lessons you know you read them and you burst <coughs> out crying 
and you're thinking, how can I have, how can I support that children? Not every teacher can, but I think it's something that, you know, as a, as a community, as, as, a, as, a, as a society that really are passionate about children's achievement and where we stand in making sure that our children have got all the tools, we need to really make sure that we put things in place for them. Andrea, for the moment, thank you. Uh, Kerry Tong's president of the NUT, I mean, this kind of, you know, segues beautifully <laughs> into what I was going to ask you, because I know that the NUT has a 20 Simple Acts campaign, and the whole point is to help support teachers, support the students. So just talk us a little bit through the campaign, especially picking up on some of the points that um, Andrea has raised. I mean, it's really interesting to hear Andrea talk because the vision she describes is exactly the one that we would want to see in all schools across the country. And I think at times in our history, we have had that. I have to tell you, we, that, that vision is at, at real serious risk at the moment. And it, it's lovely to hear that there are schools that are hanging on to that because I can tell you there are a lot of schools where there is nothing like what Andrea is describing. Um, so um, the, just to say that the, I mean, I'm actually a teacher as well. Oh, two teachers. Sorry, I'm two teachers. Tell <laughs> <laughs> Hamlet. Um, but um, the, wow. the, the, the 20 Simple Acts thing is actually part of uh, the Refugee Week, which we partnered with. Um, and the, and it came, we were very keen to join in with that program because as a union, we know that our members are very keen on, on you know, trying to make schools welcoming places for refugees and migrants. And they have created a lot of resources um, and a lot of ideas and good practice that they are doing in their schools like Andrew's doing. And we wanted to make sure that that was available to everybody so that everybody could get that information because that is not something the government is doing for teachers. That, that There's no kind of training on this for PGC. And Andrea talked about the importance of training for teachers. The PGC training course at the minute is very much uh, school-based. There is a decreasing amount of pedagogy in it. There's very little anti-racist, anti-sexist yeah. education. So this idea that you may have had about what teacher training should be and what it looks like, it probably looks nothing like that at the minute. It's very much at the chalk face. Get on with it. Start delivering. So we're trying to offer some resources on our website. Um, I'll just commend this booklet to you. I'm, I won't talk about it in detail, but this is kind of a rough guide of all the things that we think are good practice, and many of them Andrea has actually described, so that we hope teachers will come to this of their own accord and introduce it. And the 20 Simple Acts was part of that. So it was an idea during Refugee Week, there were 20 simple things you could do to try and make your school more welcoming for, re for refugee or migrant children. Simple things, learning words in different languages, or um, having a social event where you celebrate the culture um, and, and heritage of, of, other, of other communities, or bringing in um, 20 objects that tell the story of a refugee. So really creative, nice ideas that are about changing the rhetoric, changing the climate around refugees, which as we know is, is uh, pretty horrendous. Um, uh, and, you know, I would say as well that the, the, the good practice of things like arts, drama, music, PSHE, schools are increasingly not offering those <coughs> subjects. So those places where those things, you, where you would take up these things, I know of a school that has just shut its music department in London. The kids in that school don't get music. You think what music would mean to a child that maybe doesn't have English as, its first, as, her, as his or her first language. Or drama, lots of schools are cutting drama. Again, a brilliant uh, medium through which you know, all children can learn to express, and express themselves and explore ideas. A lot of this stuff is, is really getting taken out of our curriculum because, because of ideology, I would say, and also because of funding cuts. And there's another issue as well, because I was uh, looking at some of the stats, and even though we've just been describing how you know, diverse teachers make for happier uh, diverse students, actually, apparently 31% of minority teachers actually face discrimination in schools in the UK, so almost the opposite of them being seen as an asset. Um, what else can you tell us about it, and, and what mm. can be done to stop it? Um, I've just been I've just spent the weekend with at our black teachers conference actually so we've been doing a lot of talking around this and again we've had a, a report we did a couple of years ago which was called barriers which is looking at the barriers that face black and minority ethnic teachers I know that's not strictly speaking the refugee but it, it's an indication of how people who are considered to be other are treated um, and actually it's pretty pretty depressing reading so we know that now a third of our primary school children are from black or minority ethnic groups um, a, a quarter of our secondary, and yet only 7% of our teachers are uh, black and minority ethnic. So that means those young people from those communities in our schools are not seeing themselves represented mm. enough in the teaching force. I mean, obviously, in, in uh, London, the, the, the figures are slightly higher for, for teachers, but it's still not enough. In Bristol, 
um, given that they have got such a high black and minority ethnic uh, community, their numbers of black teachers is, is very, very low. And so, you know, we're interested in why, why that is now. We've talked about the blocks to refugee and, and migrant teachers and those kinds of uh, legalistic sort of barriers. But actually, a lot of black and minority ethnic teachers report racism, institutionalised racism in the schools um, and in the system, a lot of microaggressions or unconscious bias. Um, they feel that incidents of racism aren't dealt with properly. Um, and they, they, we know statistically that black and minority ethnic teachers are more likely to uh, not progress in pay or are to be identified having capability issues. So really, if you were a black and minority ethnic graduate, why would you become a teacher? Who needs it? You're not paid very well anyway, as we've heard. So there is a real problem. What do we do about it? I think there are a couple of things. I think there are things we can do as a union, which we're trying to do. Um, partly, we're trying to empower our members, um, and I can talk a bit more about that if you want. We're working on an anti-racism charter, which we are we're just in the drafting stages, but the idea would be that we would get schools all around the country to want to adopt this charter and to have that kind of kite mark um, but we want to challenge schools on their clear discrimination against black staff and funding cuts is a big campaign for us at the minute because without money I mean you will always find teachers like Andrea and the, the teachers in Andrea school who will go above and beyond but there is only so much you can do so when I started teaching we had a team of section 11 teachers or English as a, as a, as a second language teacher. there were 12 of them in the department so practically every English uh, or humanities lesson had two teachers in the classroom. There is no EAL provision in most schools now. So, so that, that expertise, that one-to-one -one support, that program, they just don't exist. Kids are just chucked in in a lot of schools into the classroom and told to get on with it. Andrea, I mean, after hearing all of this, what advice would you give to perhaps a young student who is hoping to become a teacher, both from a diverse background, but I guess also maybe UK teachers not from a diverse background that don't have experience in dealing in multilingual environments, but still want to become teachers and help? What advice would you give? God, come to my school. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> yeah, come to my school. Our teachers, I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying this because it's the reality. Um, we have got um, teachers who are wearing hijabs, teaching physics, an extraordinary role model for our girls. Um, we have, you know, our, cult, our, our staffing culture is so diverse and it's, it's, it's rich and our children love that because that's their role models. Um, I would say do not let anyone prevent you from applying to be a teacher. It is an extraordinarily um, difficult job. It's not what it says on the tin. <laughs> uh, in reality, you do have 80% very stressful days, but um, at the end of that, I think those 20% moments whereby your life is just, you know, you get goosebumps because a child's done something which is beyond their wildest imagination and yours, that is why we do it. So I think teaching is um, the best job in the world, um, but go in without, with your eyes, mm. eyes wide open, go in and see schools and see where it is that you'd like to be teaching. Okay. Just a final point to you. I mean, you know, you did win this award as the best yes. teacher in the it's world. Crazy, I know. Well, you say that, but why? What do you think it was about your I've style of teaching? No oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no idea. I'm still trying to. I'm still trying to work it out. Why I teach in a London school? Um, I tell you what it is. I think it's um, something which I would like to think that every every teacher does in the UK, and that's not just believe that their job is done at the end of that lesson and in their classroom. I think what we do is more, is, is more the pastoral work and supporting our children and making sure that things are okay for them no matter what and putting provision in, um, you know, supporting other teachers, uh, teaching other people. I think, I, I mean, and again, it, it's the arts for me. I think the, um, the panel, the, 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 the colleagues who voted for me, I think they were just completely blown away with the fact that arts do make such an incredible difference to every student's lives. And the fact that schools are, and you're absolutely right, schools are um, reducing their art curriculums and it's the most dangerous thing that we can be doing at this moment in time. Um, just a final question to Emma and then we'll open up to questions uh, again. Emma Starr, Student Action for Refugees, the NGO you work for, is one of the biggest human rights campaigning uh, networks in the UK. And I think a lot of your work is actually undertaken by student volunteers. Now, considering how toxic the debate around refugees can be, all the difficulties and challenges that we've heard about now, how do you go about, I guess, you know, in enthusing your, your volunteers and how would you convince a young person listening to you now you know, to, to get involved and become an advocate? 
I actually have the opposite problem. I have to calm them down. That's you good. Um, it's, you know, I, I see it, it's toxic, but it's really polarised. You know, I'm, I'm an old hand. It's been doing this since 95 when people, you know, liked refugees. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, this is a new thing. You know, well, it's not a new thing. Britain kind of goes like this and we're in a... Um, but, but <laughs> so, you know, th this, this toxicity started in the late 90s. There are reasons for it. There were significant numbers coming in. At the same time, the government decided to do this dispersal program and send loads of people, just as you were talking about, to very poor places in the UK without any community development and additional resources. So there's a very clear pattern of what happened here. And, um, you know, the... The events of 2015, I think, shocked everybody. You know, there are kids like Alan Curdy dying every day. You know, don't mm -hmm. pretend it's not happening. It's happening right now on a beach somewhere in the Mediterranean. 2,000 people have died this year, many of them children. So there was something about, you know, this social media age we live in. Everyone's like, oh my God, refugees now. I must be nice yeah. about them, you know. Yeah. So we, it's, it's just polarised. You know, we have the young people who are this, this growing identitist movement currently, you know, particularly in sort of, it's coming out of Austria, but it's a, um, we, we have them in the UK, you know, I, I, I'm not a racist, but my identity is under attack, and that's mm. a very young, cool movement, and that, they're, they're going after the youth. But I think we have their souls, actually, to, to be frank. What I see on campus is a huge outpouring of desire to, to be humanitarian, and that's not just around refugees. You see it across the whole thing. You see it across the gender debate. You see it, you know, across... You know, absolutely every aspect of it. You also have the kind of crazy, and unfortunately, they do seem to live in the rugby club. Who kind of who, who get the the sort of you know the kids shouting at the, the black student on campus. That happens. Um, but you know, we had our conference at the weekend, and um, the energy and enthusiasm in that room was huge. We've grown from we had 2,000 members in, in 2008. You know, we have 34,000 members now, and that's that's the members. You know, that that their friends and the people that... So it's, I, I'm very positive about the future. I think when you look at the polling, um, you know, attitudes to, my, to migration, you know, they change at age 47. The question is, do we all change when we get 47 or is this generation kind of getting better? I'm positive. I think they're getting better. Um, so, you know, what, what we find is you give people things to do. You know, what, what I say to people is think about your power, think about what's useful. So um, if you live in a community and in your community there are newly arrived people, you too are newly arrived into this city, what would you want? They're very global now, kids. They've all travelled. They, if not, they've all been on the internet and they have international friends. So, for example, we, you know, an entry point for us is the volunteering, so we have conversation clubs. And we've set up these 17 conversation clubs across the, the country um, where the, the students will, will in, in, a, in a refugee um, community organisation, they'll sit and they're trained and supported by teachers and the refugees will tap and they'll have two hours of conversation. And that's people learning from each other and learning together. My, my one thing that I say to them all is think about your power, but also think about what's not useful. You know, so we will, we will only support people to volunteer inside existing refugee organisations which are refugee led you know they absolutely must be led by refugees themselves um, in terms of campaigning I will you know only endorse two or three campaigns at a time and yes it's very nice to change the world but let's just think about people won't listen to you if you're sitting in the corner shouting and my final thing which I'm constantly on them about is you know this volunteering is not about you. It's about this person who, who has been through far worse than you and is a normal person going through an abnormal event. So, you know, the events of, of sort of the, the British uh, students going down to Calais and, and Lesbos, they're still there. They're doing an amazing job. But, you know, let's, let's, let's use our experience to empower, um, to share what we have with other people and, and maybe do a bit more here for the people that are here because there's, you know, 25,000 people a year coming in who, who do need our support. Emma, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. And now we can um, ask them some questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Samara Garg. I'm from the National Education Union. And I don't have a question, but I just wanted to offer a thought. Uh, we talked in the previous uh, panel about what should be the balance between what might be the host uh, <coughs> curriculum and uh, traditions reflected in the curriculum and that of the refugees or migrants. <coughs> And I think that it may, um, and I'm, I'm a teacher by profession as well, uh, and I think there may be a way in which uh, we could conceptualize the curriculum which would apply globally, which would be to think about the curriculum as something which is a, a mirror and a window. 
So it actually helps you to reflect your own traditions and, and heritage within the curriculum, but it also opens the world through the window to the, to the wider world. So I'm, I'm just offering that as a way of conceptualizing the curriculum. Um, I'll take another question before we, we respond to that point as well. Yeah. First of all, thanks for three wonderful women, all of whom Aww. have practical contributions. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is very encouraging to hear of stories of people who have worked hard and who have achieved and helped other people to achieve. Uh, I want to ask two things. One is, I think what Brent has done is fantastic and it couldn't have been done without huge hard work. But there's one advantage. Your school is in an area which is already multicultural and diverse. I think of, the, of a Syrian family sent with all the best will in the world to a village in the Cotswolds, yeah. and two Chirian, Syrian children yeah. go to the school, yeah. Yeah. which is already probably a fairly, fairly restricted school in terms of culture and attitude. And I think it's very much harder, really, to try and do something to help yeah. the teachers who are working in those environments where they don't have any experience and they somehow have to enable respect for these children from a totally different planet. Uh, and it's far harder, I really think, to see how that works out. That's my first question. My second is a bit more general, but I think throughout this conference, we sort of live in our education bubble. And it seems to me that if we're really going to achieve, and children going to school, uh, indigenous children from this country are going to school with an attitude to be welcoming to refugee children and be interested in them, it's to do with the adult environment around them. And I really want to ask what we are doing. Fadi, I think, said the main thing, talked about advocacy. And I, I do wonder if we're doing enough in the way of advocacy in a world where people are sitting around talking about, you know, even Europeans are total enemies and bullies and all these things. What about somebody coming from Syria or wherever? And I think one of the problems is you won't get change unless you try and do something to provide a kind of more open public education where you're not thinking in terms of certificates, you're thinking in terms of the people of this country who are to be enabled to understand in a different way the kind of things that we are worried about and we've had such a rich experience of today. Because without that, I don't give good hope to any teacher who's trying to struggle without the, the goodwill of the people around. Thank you. Andrew, you want to start answering? I don't know how to answer that one. It's quite, it's quite a unique question. So I would like to think and turn, I always look at things from the, from the viewpoint of the students. Um, I, I love to do that, and I find that with students, the more that, you know, we underestimate them. Children are very curious young beings, so I not, I not, and when they, when they do see something different, they, are, they do go up and say, who are you? Where are you from? And I think that's the beauty about it. I completely, I, I completely get your point about the, the, the adults there and how, how we, how we um, try and accommodate that particular situation. I think it's really about preparation and knowledge and making sure that before the students go into that school that the, the staff are completely aware and have got again the tools, the skills required to enable those students to be embedded well into the community. That's an ideal situation um, but again it's about preparation and making sure that everything is in place. But would you have had a harder time in the Cotswolds than Brent? I've not taught in the Cotswolds. <laughs> um, I don't think I would like to teach there. <laughs> um, but. Um, I, I think as a child you probably have to, have to be a bit resilient. My children are mixed race and I, I send them to a school and I, I sometimes they do notice that they are um, a minority in their own school and I always do question them, I don't know how we, but, but at the end of the day I know that they have got role models around them who they're able to associate themselves with. Um, and I think it's, it's that, it's being able to reassure the children and say, you know, this is, um, you know, Lewis Hamilton, mixed race, wow, what an incredible um, role model you've got there, um, who looks similar like you, you know. So I think it's about seeing what is the, how, who they can identify with and making sure that they have that in their mindset that those people have achieved, I will achieve too. If I can, um, 
I, I think there's, there's two points on that. The, the, the thing about the Cotswolds, you know, I'm, I'm presuming they're there under the community sponsorship programme. Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge. You know, my, I started my work with, with refugees in Vietnam who were just sort of, they, they called it the Marmite approach and they sent, you know, a family to everywhere. And then I worked in Hackney where they all came back and lived in much worse accommodation because they were like, well, it was nice. You know, I, I had a, a, one of my friends had been dispersed to Glen Eagles and was really good at playing uh, golf, but he couldn't speak any English at all. It was, you know, and, pe and I think, you know, British people are very welcoming, you know, generally if they don't feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is, there is a, there's something in it, um, but um, I'm thinking, you know, a, a very, very good friend of mine is the child of one of the, these, uh, she came over as a, ki a Vietnamese kid and they, they were sent to live somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And she's very interesting about it. She said it was lovely because she was at peace and her dad was calm at last and, that, and the other kids were weird to her and she found that very, very difficult. But she remembers the headmaster being absolutely delightful. And I think, like I say, you know, children are very resilient and one person, she, you know, she's done exceptionally well, she's an architect, it's all, you know, she's great. Mm. So I think it is about sort of thinking carefully. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the challenges we have is people getting too overexcited and, you know, like, oh, how can I help you, little person, you know, um, <laughs> and look, look for the shared humanity rather than the difference yeah. often. Um, but I think there is that we do have a problem, this thing about um, education, about, about um, uh, multiculturalism, <laughs> difference, whatever you want to call it, you know, um, you used to have, so when I started work in 95, I, I worked for a Vietnamese-led community organisation that was heavily funded by local and central government through the, the policies then. And, and, you know, I was a community development worker. I'm an anthropologist and also a teacher. Because we live <laughs> Three. Um, everywhere. <laughs> three. Um, so, but, you know, it, the money dried up. After the Luxor attacks, multiculturalism was over. Don't think it started any, any you know, uh, later than that. You know, when Al-Qaeda went and, and, and shot up a load of tourists in, in Luxor, the, the money stopped for us in Hackney, where I was working, um, very, very quickly. And then um, we we got to the we got to the point now where it's all about prevent, you know, and it's all yeah, and it feels yeah. like they're trying to make everybody assimilate, yeah. and and you know my business, which was of how can I as I'm also I, half English, half Danish, so I'm used to growing up in a in a half uh, a foreign household and not speaking the language. How can I was always interested in how we can come together as a community. And growing up in, in, in sort of Camden, as I did, I was quite used to that. But it feels like that has been lost, that sort of honour and respect for our forebears and what we bring and then how we've come together is, is being lost. And I think, it's, I think it's policy, and I'm very, very worried about it, very worried about it. Karen, if you want to add to that point, and also the other point that was raised by, raised by uh, the lady over there, um, whether it's possible to have an international curriculum can there really be such a thing? Well, I hope so. I mean, I think clearly the curriculum we've got at the minute doesn't work. Actually, I don't think it works for any of our kids. I think some kids are better at gaming the system. Um, but actually, I think it's quite a narrow, uh, po po sort of impoverished curriculum, very test driven. I think there's a increasing numbers of kids who are alienated. They, the education isn't addressing the issues they're concerned about. We don't bring global issues into the school. I was head of a department of a, of a subject called Global Perspectives and we've got rid of it because it doesn't tick the Progress 8 box and the school needs to tick the Progress 8, eight box. So we've deprived the children of a really global subject. And what was that subject? Well, it was, it, it, was, it was literally, um, it was a research, uh, subject, so the children pick the thing they're interested in, whether it's education or deforestation or, or, you know, any number of global issues, and then ask themselves a question and then had to ch try and find the answer to it. And through that, not only kind of found out a lot about the world, but also developed really independent learning, developed confidence and so on, really good prepar preparation for university. But, 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 but the curriculum we've got at the minute does not centre what the child wants or what the child needs. It centres what can be counted, and that is a real problem. So we have got increasing numbers of alienation. We've got a failure to diagnose special educational needs. We've got uh, CAMS, which is the mental health system, them is, is massively underfunded, so children who are not coping well are not getting the help that they need. So I think we need a change of perspective. I think what we maybe need is to stop thinking about multiculturalism and start thinking about interculturalism um, and, de and devising a curriculum that is inclusive of everybody, that is rich, that is broad, that has a space for the arts, but that is also global. And I mean that in the sense of not just being the world, but actually uh, looking at the curriculum from lots of different perspectives. So if we take something like Black History Month, which I'm sure um, some schools 
schools, at least every school in the country did an assembly on Black History Month at the first week because they all panicked that they weren't doing anything and you can bet your bottom dollar that in that Black History Month in most schools there would have been Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King and a bit about slavery. Now that is not black history, I'm sorry, that is not black history and no disrespect to Nelson or Martin. I mean, it, it's very reductive, you know, and actually a lot of black people will say to you, slavery interrupted black history. Black history is much more than that. So I want to see a curriculum where black history isn't taught on one, one week in October or one month in October. It's integral to the curriculum because actually black history is British history and British values. So why are we not teaching it? It should be absolutely part of our curriculum. The, um, just on the question of the, 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 the school in the Cotswolds, those, well, so this, so this, is a, this is a really interesting point because we expect different things of different schools. I can tell you that the way Prevent is taught in areas that are majority white will be very different, or trained in, in majority white, is very different from the way it's, it's done in, in majority black areas like in mine in Tower Hamlets. And there's, a, there's an uh, innate racism in this country, I'm afraid, that we have to confront. And we talk about schools addressing the issues. Actually, we are working in a very hostile environment, and our children are living in a very hostile environment. Our own prime minister was responsible for sending vans into Croydon, telling immigrants to go home. Our, our children know that. We've got the Windrush uh, si uh, situation recently. Our children see that happening. We don't talk about it in schools, but they see it happening. And the fact that we don't talk about it means that they start to feel that this isn't, isn't their home. Bob, uh, Boris Johnson with the letterbox niqab remarks, absolutely outrageous. But so these are the kinds of messages that are happening outside our schools that we're having to try and deal with. And I don't think we're dealing with it very well. So definitely things like, um, oh, sorry, just I wanted to say on the, 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 the school in the Cotswolds. I was in a school recently, which was majority white, um, in the hills of uh, out Greater Manchester. Very few BME kids, but it had a global uh, approach. So the mural, which had two kids on it, uh, had one black kid and one white kid. Uh, the, the curriculum consciously integrated different global stories so that those children were not other, and to those white children in the school, they didn't see those children as other. This, was, this is the world in which they were living, and I think it is possible. I think we should make that demand of those schools as much, as much. We shouldn't just leave the anti-racism to the schools like in Brent or in Tower Hamlets. It should be absolutely a massive demand of a majority white school to, to deal with these issues. I'm Rosemary Preston. I've much enjoyed the afternoon, and congratulations on all of you at the bottom now and those previously. Um, I think, in a way, I would have liked a little bit for everybody of the history of the recognition of refugee status, what's happened to it, why it's disappeared, and how education was manifest post Second World War subsequently here and in other parts of the world. Crystal Blackman arrived in my Hampstead Primary School one day when I was in the final year. Mr. White from New Zealand had been 60 odd, had been carefully teaching us about her civilizing the masses in the underdeveloped parts of the world. And day one, he got his cane out, and for the next six months, caned Christopher Blackman every day. I went to school in Camden, and day one, it was amazing. A very welcoming agenda, headmistress welcoming everybody, and I want to make it very clear that we offer Jewish prayers to all of you who wish to go to that and come back later for the assembly. 30% of the girls were out of the Holocaust. Okay? I think we see the welcoming and we see the brutality of it. But over the years, and I've worked a lot on refugee issues, over the years, um, we've seen the decline of respect for the convention of refugee and asylum, and we've seen, always we've seen, that whatever investment there was in social well-being, whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about education, whatever was provided was publicized. But it said very precious little about how tiny the numbers of beneficiaries there were in the publicity that was being afforded, and how huge the numbers of those who got <coughs> nothing in camps in God knows where, um, and wh what happened to them. And I think we've seen a reversion of things that were quite positive. I welcome Emma's story and also Andrea's enormously. Um, but I think we have to see these fluctuations 
and we have to see the political context globally and more locally. Hi, um, I'm David Archer from uh, ActionAid. Um, I just want to reflect, I've been coming to the launches of the Global Education Monitoring Report for many, many years, and uh, I think it's very striking how I think this year has been very successful at connecting what is the global discourse to a national discourse here. For many years, the Global Education Monitoring Report was framed by the MDGs and the Education for All Goals, which are all about uh, really focusing on developing countries rather than focusing on a global agenda. And I think one of the biggest steps that is achieved by the Sustainable Development Goals is to say this is a universal agenda and let's not treat it as if we're here and we're just helping people elsewhere. I think that's part of the shifting of the framing is hugely important and contributes to a deeper understanding. I think it's uh, extremely difficult when we do have a curriculum which still basically uh, refuses to acknowledge uh, British colonial history, imperial history, and, uh, and the damage that this country has done to other parts of the world. So I think that would obviously help. But coming back to the SDGs, I think SDG goal 4.7, which looks at the role of education in building global citizenship, is something which I think which we could explore further in terms of sort of developing some sort of sense of a, a not exactly a universal curriculum, but an area of the curriculum which needs to be acknowledged. And it's both the content of recognizing that every child, if we're ever going to have any chance of achieving the sustainable development goals, it's going to be the next generation of young people of active citizens who are going to be uh, needing to take uh, uh, key action, not absolving ourselves of responsibility, but they need to be right at the heart of that change process and understand the full agenda of the sustainable development goals. That's partly about learning about content, but it's also about the process of learning and building critical thinking and problem-solving skills, which is embedded in that 4.7. So it would be interesting to reflect on, you know, can we use that goal 4.7 to really start advancing towards a, a, a deeper understanding of, uh, of building a, a sort of a global uh, common agenda, which is, in a sense, what it's intended to be. Uh, one more question, last one, and then I'll ask you for closing remarks. Thank you very much. Madeleine Arnott from, um, I've got a Center for the Global Human Movement, uh, study of global human movement. I really wanted to ask how the panel saw the role of research, because I just think it's not being mentioned at all. It's actually, we're getting a, 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 a huge range of activism, a lot of policy development, but I don't know where research sits in this story. When we, had, when we pushed on the women's movement, we precisely worked in partnership with the teaching profession and the NUT. We worked with local government. We worked in partnership to create new knowledge. And this area is massively short of research. It's massively short of funds to do research. The organizations, uh, whether it's BASE or ACFIAT, also haven't got enough of research there on migration. Um, and the, the, we have so much to learn from other countries about what, uh, uh, and research from other countries and some of the issues you've raised today. For example, if you look at how American schools have responded to the Latino, um, the Hispanic uh, migrant children, we learn about empowering the parents by putting them on the governing bodies of schools, giving them a voice on governing bodies. I don't, that hasn't come through here yet in Britain. Um, the new, the values of the immigrant community, they talked about the new values, of, the values rather of personal amente, which is a different ethos towards schooling, which they, the school could then use. In, um, in Australia, we've got the, the supplementary teacher training qualifications to help teachers learn after their initial training how to work with refugee communities. Um, this research has to come in somewhere. Um, and I think that, that for I, I'm in the university world. I see a lot of the graduates actually taking up the issue of, of migration research. But unless the organizations working on this field actually form partnerships with us, you're losing an opportunity. Uh, we're being, in a way, pushed back out. And, in the res and just as an example, final example, the research that I did with colleagues, we went into schools and asked some of the, what we call citizen kids, I, the, we don't call them natives, we call them citizen children. I don't like the language of natives. Um, and when we asked them, do you think that these children, do you think that the uh, refugee child should come and live in Britain? Um, they were enormously empathetic and sympathetic in our the responses. Um, they said they could be uh, British, but they can't be English, because in order to be English, <laughs> you've got to be able to eat fish and chips. Um, they said, oh, we said, do you think they should stay in Britain? They said, Britain, it's better if they didn't stay in Britain, because they'd be safer from racism if they lived in Canada or Russia. 
we have not got the research on how British, British in kids respond to migrant children. We do not have that research in place. Just as we, years ago, didn't have the research on how boys responded to girls. We need that research. And I'm just very interested to know how you perceive whether there's a, how you perceive research from the own, your own experiences. Thank you. So that question, final sort of comments from all of you. Yeah. Um, absolutely. We, in the National Education Union, we love research. We do a lot of research, and our research is really good. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying we've got particular research on the exact topics that you're talking about, but, you know, make a pitch. Um, but, no, genuinely, we, 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 you know, in order to win the, the, the vision that we have, okay, for the world, not just for schools, we know that we have to base what we're, what we're demanding in, in, in reality and in evidence and in data and in research. So, for example, I mentioned the barriers report that we did into the, the life experience of black and minority ethnic teachers. That is helping us effect real change and come up with strategies to, to approach that. We did a recent report on uh, challenge, uh, the sexual harassment in schools, which again has kick-started a big movement in the education system to actually start putting things in place to challenge that sexual harassment in schools. Our most successful research really has been actually not so much research but using other people's research which is using the government's data to prove that they're underfunding schools which we have done very successfully and the government came to us and said your data is wrong and we said well if it's wrong it's your fault because it's your data yeah. so we understand absolutely the power of really good research and really kind of robust data absolutely because it helps us win our arguments just on finally on the international um, the, the importance of international understanding and I think this is research but maybe not in an academic sense we have an international department in our union and it is growing and growing. We uh, know that international work, solidarity work, brings members into activity, so it's really good for building the union um, anyway. But also we know that when we send our, our members across to visit people in other countries, and we send, them, we send delegations to all sorts of places. So recently um, we've sent delegations to Cuba and, and Palestine and Finland and uh, Nicaragua. So we have got working teachers in the classroom going out and seeing what life is like for teachers in students in other countries. They, those visits are absolutely transformative, absolutely vital, and they just change your, the way that you see the world. The impact is absolutely huge, so you'll find no, no objection to me, from me for, to research and, and experience, absolutely. Um, so I think there's two points. Well, um, on research, I mean, we are an activism network, obviously, um, but we, are, we sit within universities, so we are, everything we do is underpinned by research. It's not sort of running out to, to do something randomly. We, we consider ourselves to be part of, you know, the wider refugee and migrant and human rights uh, network uh, movement. Um, there are, uh, there's, I don't know if you're aware of the uh, Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford, which um, was founded sort of some years ago to sort of draw together all the research, specifically actually to counter the nonsense that's put in a lot of the media. Um, and say, look, you know, if you, if, you, if you Migration Watch want to spin something like this, well, let's, let's get a, a professor to spin it back at you. And that's been very, very successful. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you something back now. You know, as, as a, you know, I'm a frontline worker. That's what I do. Um, and I'm a refugee rights advocate and everything. And the, to me, the most important thing is what the community asks me. That, that, I'm always going to ask them first. And one of the challenges I have is with researchers and, and artists, and particularly since 2015, constantly saying, I need to speak to refugees. Can I have a refugee? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, no, you know, basically not, because just why? Um, and, and what I find is often people come to me with pre, pre a plan, and can I get them some people to, pr to, to help them with their plan? Um, and what I would much rather is they start with me and say, what are the challenges that you are facing? You know, so there are lots of questions around barriers to higher education for, for refugees and asylum seekers that we haven't answered. And what I've got on the other side is a load of researchers that ask me different questions, which aren't quite what I want. And then when I say to them, well, can you do it? They say, well, can you help us with a funding bid? And I say, no, because I'm a small NGO and no. You know, <laughs> so I think there's a, com a better conversation to be had. And then, you know, as a challenge to the bigger NGOs in the audience, you know, I work with some of the bigger NGOs and I see them using research as an as a, a underpin for a campaign which is then pinned into a fundraising ask and it's a six-month cycle and bang, there it is, thank you very much, and it's put on the shelf. So I think that there is much more that we can do um, and we need to work much more closely together. And in terms of, um, you know... I, I, sort of, I can't quite remember which answer this is, but um, in terms of sort of where, where we're going to go with sort of a, the, the future, if you like, I'm very, very interested in building 
a global movement of students who advocate for refugees. Now, now 25% of our members are themselves from a refugee background, and that's absolutely crucial. But if you imagine, if we'd had 34,000 students already trained and supported to volunteer and mobilised in groups in Greece, in Italy, in Lebanon, in Mexico, in Texas, you know, when these when these big movements happen, a you would have a. a a more, a more effective response, but B, I think much more importantly, you would have a strong local and global advocacy saying, you know, not in our name, we're not going to have this, don't build a wall, sorry, you know, <laughs> how can we do this effectively? People will have to flee at some point and other people will want to support them. Let's do it, let's do it in an organised fashion. Andrew? Um, just to conclude, I think um, there's so much great practice that's taking place in schools and how um, we're addressing things like the SDGs and, and looking at um, being an inclusive society. And, but the thing, I don't, I don't think that we're very good in schools at celebrating this or publishing this or, or being an advocate for what we do. And I think that's probably when research will be really crucial for us to find out actually what does good practice look like and what are other schools doing. But I think the key for me, if I'm looking at the, you know, being on senior leader as well, I'll be like, right, that's great, I've read that, but I've got 3,000 other million things that I've got to do as well. And who is going to implement that? And who's going to lead that? And I, th that one, that, but I've, they've used all my free goodwill for that one. I can't ask that person again. Um, I can't. So um, I just, we need to just think really well when it comes to adding more um, ideas and insisting that schools are had, having to do more, more things. But um, the more information we can gather of what we're doing is great because there's some fantastic work that's taking place. Um, you know, global conversations, but Skype lessons are just, you know, that, that's the new thing at the moment. Every school, I think, is linked up with Skype. We have got, we are playing, we are performing um, with a school in Hong Kong in terms of music, so we're playing the same piece, recording it. There's things like that, that are taking place everywhere. So it's just a case of, you know, what's out there? Let's go and find out and, and celebrate that. But just to finish some closing remarks here from Sebastian Hein, one of the co-authors of the report on everything that we have heard. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's difficult to tie all of that together. Um, <laughs> and I really appreciate the stunning expertise we, we've had on the panel. Um, I think we've seen um, kind of the scope of the issue of, of migration in its various forms and the fact that it's, it's growing. But also we've put that into perspective when you compare it with military spending and you know, what we need is political will. And actually, a lot of the solutions we do have, um, individuals, schools, teachers, um, some, you know, some parts of systems performing very well. And actually, we do know what needs to be done. And I think hopefully the report um, summarizes a lot of that research and synthesizes the best of what's out there and can show some of the way forward. Um, and you know, on that point, there is that flip side of responsibility sharing um, that we've, we've spoken to. You know, we, there are issues in the UK, massive issues. But on a global level, there's far more we need to be doing um, outside of the UK. Um, I hope we've demonstrated that you know, a lot of these tensions around migration um, are eased through education, and education is, is definitely an integral part of the solution. So I think I'll, I'll just end on, on that point and um, you know, thank our hosts, uh, thank Barbara for facilitating all of today, um, and say you know, this is just the beginning of a lot of these debates. Um, we're having launches all over the world. Um, there's the World Education Forum in London in January. Um, there's the Uckfurt Conference in, in 2019 where we hope to continue these discussions. So thank you for coming.